preaching through the book of Psalms, each Psalm unique, and yet there's a trail through it. Looking tonight at Psalm 46, God our refuge, God our refuge. We're not unsure of exactly who the human instrument that God used to give us this psalm. The event, we're not so sure about what it be. Many think it comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, where the city was surrounded and Jehoshaphat and the enemy was around them and how they turned to God and called upon God. And uh, God, as they sang and as they praised God, God delivered them and slew the army themselves. And so that may be the case. So we're looking at that with a little bit of that in mind, but we're looking tonight at this thing about God our refuge. Now, I need you to listen tonight carefully. I need you to be personally involved in it tonight because we're going to need this. I trust in 2024, we're going to need to know where our refuge is. And if you wait until the storm comes, you wait till it's really pressing upon you, it may be too late to find that refuge because our spirit and our minds are so occupied. So we need to know where God, our refuge, is. So Psalm 46, verse number one, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will, we, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, through the waters thereof roar, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, through the, though the mountains shake with swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the whole place of the tabernacles, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttereth his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. But still, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Father, we need you tonight. Lord, it's a weary day right now for some. It's been a long day of work or preparations and just the things of life. And it's easy for us to pause and let our minds wander. But Lord, I pray in these next few minutes that you would help us. Lord, I need this. I need to understand about you being my refuge. So Holy Spirit, take control of the preaching and the service tonight that you would speak to us in a unique and special way so when those storms come, when the difficulties arise, we know where our refuge is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. God is our refuge. We need to know how to find it. We need to know that He is our refuge. 2024, we have no idea what the, year, what the year holds. Now, Christ could come back before we're done, and the whole year be gone as far as we're concerned, but we have no idea what this year may behold. It may be an easy year. It may be a smooth year. It may be a year without persecution. It may be a year of just joy. But most likely, for most folks, there's going to be some times of storms. There's going to be some times of troubles. There's going to be times of heartache and some, some pressures in our life. You may think that you've gone through the worst of your life. You may be able to look back and say, boy, last year or five years ago, or maybe the last 10 years have been tragic. The last 10 years have been so much pressure and so much burden and so many tears. You might think, boy, as I head into 2024, it's going to be easy from here on. Don't count on it. It could be a very, very challenging year. You may think things can't get worse, but they may. <coughs> Excuse me. 2024 may be the year that makes these verses I'm about to read real to you. How many understand that sometimes there's verses we can quote, verses that have been preached, verses we've said amen to, but they've really not been real to us until the trial comes. They've never really been burned into our psyche. They've never been burned into our heart until we've gone through and needed those verses. But 2024 may be the year we need these verses. For example, in 2 Timothy 3.11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Icaim, at Lystra, 
what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2024 may be the year where it gets worse and worse and worse. Persecutions may arrive. Afflictions may arise. The fact that we preach about the preaching the truth of the Word of God, what God says about the homosexual movement, what God says about sodomy, what God says about training up our children, what God says about all the things. And I don't like preaching about that as much as I seem to have to, but because the world is preaching the opposite to you day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, and our young people and our children, and we have to be reminded what God says about it. But right now we can still preach it without any, <coughs> excuse me, persecution without them coming in and closing the doors, without them coming in and arresting us. So far. In Canada, they don't have that privilege. That's against the law to preach such things. So it may happen in 2024 that it comes that way. So the persecutions and mockings and scourgings may come to us. And we're going to need to find our refuge. When those things come, we've got to find that place of safety. We've got to find that place of security. In 1 Peter 4.12, another verse that may in this year become real to you. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad also with exceeding joy. This may be a year of really fiery trials, that you get hungry more and more. I guarantee you, as the trials get hotter, as the trials get harder, as the persecutions arise, we will look more excitedly at the return for Jesus Christ. There will be something in our lives to say, boy, I can hardly wait. Right now, we're so comfortable. We're so much having so much fun playing with our iPads and iPods and doing all those things. We're not real anxious for Him to come. But as we get those persecutions come, we keep looking up. So, would you go get me a little bit of water? I got a little tickle in my throat. Thank you very much. And if I'm going to be able to preach all four hours, I'll need that. So this may be the year where those things come. This may be the year where those things become real. So we need to have a refuge, a place to go. If you're just taking notes by way of introduction, refuge means, in there in the Hebrew, a shelter, a hope. It comes from a root word, it means to flee for protection, confidence. So somewhere to flee for protection, to flee for confidence, a shelter, and a hope. In other words, it's got to be a place we can enter. There's a place we must be able to go into. You can't say, over there is my refuge, so I'm safe in this storm. No, we have to enter the refuge. We have to enter that protection. So you and I, when the storms are coming, we've got to know who it is, where it is, and how to enter therein. Because listen, if we're not inside, if we've not entered our refuge, we're not safe. If we're not entered our refuge, we're still at, at, at danger of the enemy. So it's a place that we enter. Number two, it's a place we endure the storm. Thank you very much. So a place of refuge is a place where we endure the storm. It doesn't take the storm away. It helps us endure the storm. It helps us endure the trial. It helps us endure those things as long as we stay in it. Are you listening? So we got the refuge. You got to enter it. You've got to enter it. And then you have to endure the storm by staying in. Also, it's a place to escape the harm and the misery and the hurts. So a refuge is that place when these trials come, when these heartaches come, when the persecutions come, and all these things we don't think we can make it. It is a place we can go, we enter, we endure, and we escape. Because if we don't, if you don't, if I don't, you're likely not to survive. You know, my salvation is secure. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about if we, in 2024, if Jesus tarries his coming and persecutions do arise and heartaches do arise or in your personal life, there is such trauma and such storm and such difficulty and you don't have that place of refuge and you don't run into it, you may not survive it. You may not be in church a year from now. You may not be walking with God. You may be so disappointed, so discouraged and so embittered that you're just far away. How many know Christians who have gone through trials and difficulties and because they did not enter their refuge, because they did not stay in their refuge they're not serving God and walking with God today it happens and it can happen to you and it can happen to me so it, so if we're going to survive and not just survive and say boy that was close but to come out stronger to come out rejoicing to come out more walking with God then we're going to have to know our refuge as the psalmist is talking about here so looking at verse number one it says God is our refuge and strength not only is our refuge but we see the strength there the word strength there means force security and boldness 
Boy, we need security. We need boldness. Amen? You see, when we get in the trials and difficulties, we're more likely to be quiet. We're more likely to subdue. But God says here that He's our, str our strength, our boldness. Now, looking over the psalm, I'm, I'm going to get to the message here in a second, but by way of introduction, looking over this psalm, it's obviously three stanzas. Three stanzas, three verses, if you will, in this psalm, each separated by Selah. If you remember our study of Selah, it's a musical term which means to rest, or as I like to put it, pause and think of that. Think of that. In other words, we stop in what we're either told or will be told, we're to think of it. So looking at that, at verse number 1, it talks about God being our refuge. Verse number 1, it says, and God is our refuge. Well, I'm glad it's God and not just the church. I'm glad it's God and not the pastor. I'm glad, talk to me class, I'm glad it's God is our refuge. So God is our refuge. Then in verse number 3, it ends with Selah. Verse number 3, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swelling thereof, Selah. God is our refuge, there's Selah. Verse number 7, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Verse number 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. So we've got three different verses laid out here where it reminds us God is our refuge and we're to consider that and think of that. And so each of these stanzas tells us something different, some other way that God helps us as our, being our refuge. Three other ways, three ways God is our refuge. Three ways that we can run into Him and go to Him and endure when the storms come. So we're going to see how He's our refuge and how we can make Him our refuge. Now, just by way of introduction again, in each of these parts, in each of these three, Three verses in each of these three stanzas separated by he's our refuge and Selah in each of those the key part the key part of that is his presence the presence of God in our life again verse number one God is our refuge there it is he is verse number five God is in the midst of her so we've got His presence with us. And again in verse number 11, it says the Lord of hosts is with us. So we're talking about His presence. Listen, if, we don't, if we're not in the presence of God, we have no real refuge. I mean, we can have all the right thinking we want. We can have all the positive thinking we want. But if God's presence isn't there, if we're not in His presence, if we cannot sense His presence, if we're not walking with Him, we really have no refuge. The refuge is key, is His, his presence of God. Exodus 33, 15, a tremendous verse. And he said unto me, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. So we got to understand, it's his presence. So his refuge, he is our refuge. But it's his presence that makes the, ref the refuge. So very quickly tonight, three different ways we find God is my refuge. And he's going to need to be mine. He's not going to need to be yours when these things come. So here we go. You with me tonight? All right, stay awake and we'll get out of here. Well, we'll get out of here. Number one, He is our present help in our troubles. He is our refuge by being our present help in troubles. Look at verse number one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Oh, I tell you what, we're going to have trouble. I'm glad He is our help, our present help in trouble. The word trouble there means tightness, narrow, or pinching place. Tightness, narrow, or pinching place. In other words, that trouble he's talking about there is between a rock and a hard place. You ever feel like you're just being compressed? You ever feel like you're being pressured? You ever feel like you just got to get out, but you don't know a way of escape? Anybody been like that? Boy, the pressures come, the difficulties come, and that's those troubles that come on. We all have those troubles. We all have those pressures where we don't know how to escape. We can't seem to eliminate it, but the pressure is there. So in 2024, you might find yourself in trouble. You might find yourself, and I pray not, but you may find yourself in marital trouble. Say, preacher, we got a perfect marriage, except for my spouse. You may find yourself in marital trouble. Severe trouble that you don't know how to get out of. And the pressure is building, and the pressure is getting harder, and you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know how to get out. It may be Trouble with your children. 
It may be your children letting you down. It may be your children finding themselves in sin. It might be your children uh, that just bring difficulty to your life. It may be children's health. Your children may get sick. Your children may die. I don't know, but there's going to be some pressure, some trouble, and you're going to feel that around you and just say, what can I do? How can I go on? I'm going to need a refuge, a place of protection, a place of help to help me endure that. It may be trouble that's financial. Boy, as, as our country starts going farther and farther away from God, we could experience certainly another depression or worse. It could be all just taken out of the way. So it may be some financial trouble in your life. You may lose your job. You may lose your house. You may be living underneath a, a bridge somewhere. It, who knows what kind of trouble we may have. It may be persecution trouble. Again, we talk about living for God. The state may want to come take your children because you've forced them to go to church, because you've not catered to some gender. You haven't asked them what their gender is. Hello. That's the pressure that goes on to California law these days. It may be that persecution, the pressure, and you feel it in your life. And you say, I don't know how I'm going to get by there. I don't know how I'm going to endure this. We need to have a refuge. And that refuge is this very present help in trouble. First of all, we see God is a present help. God is a present help. God, verse number one, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, obviously it deals with this present, but what's interesting, and I'm not going to try to Hebrew this together, but that word Hebrew there for pleasant, present means to come forth to appear. To come forth to appear. In other words, he shows up. Aren't you glad Jesus shows up at just the right time? He's our present help. In other words, He shows up to help us. He makes Himself clear to help us. He manifests Himself to help us. He shows up just at the right time. Just like in the Jehoshaphat story, if this in 2 Chronicles, if this is where that comes from, boy, the enemy was surrounding them. They didn't have any water. They didn't have any food. But God showed up just in time. We think about in the storm. In the storm when Jesus was walking on the water, Matthew 14, 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea tossed with waves for the wind was contrary and the fourth watch of the night they were afraid they were weary they thought they were going to die Jesus went unto them walking on the sea he didn't go in the first watch he didn't go in the first hour but there at the end where they were wore out where they thought it was over Jesus showed up how many glad we can count on Jesus showing up at the right time oh but he doesn't show up when we want him sometimes but he shows up when we need him or in the case of Lazarus waiting four days he had a plan God received the glory but he waited so but he showed up at just the right time so we find that God is our present help so the storms are raging you say I don't think I can make it but yes I can make it because Jesus is my refuge and he's going to show up just when I need him Aren't you glad God promised not to put more on us than we're able to bear, but that He will make a way of escape? So no matter how hard it is, He gives us the strength to bear it. So He is our, pers- our present help. Number two, He's our personal help. Our personal help. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to understand this. God is our refuge. Yours and my refuge. See, I can't depend on your refuge. Are you listening to me? I can't depend on your refuge. He's got to be my refuge. You can't depend on my refuge. Say, well, our pastor, he believes in the refuge. He knows all about it. That's not going to help you when the storm is on you. You have to have, it's a personal refuge. He's our personal help. You have to have that walk. You have to have the understanding. You have to go into the refuge. Can you think in your life where you found him in your refuge? Your refuge. The place where you went for protection. The place where you went for safety. The place where you went for security. Where you actually entered into his presence and you say, let the storms rage. I'm in Christ. I'm in my, my Father. I am safe and secure. I'm in his hand. I'm in his, under his wing. I'm protected by him. And sometimes that's the only thing you can do is stay in that refuge. So it's very, very personal. Look what it says. Verse number two. Therefore, we w- will not we fear, though the earth be moved. Now, the word though there means despite the fact. The word though means despite what class? The fact. It's still a fact. It's still true. It's still bad. It's still hot. It's still weary. It's still dangerous. So, but the idea is despite the fact. 
despite the fact. In other words, he is my refuge. He's my personal refuge, despite the fact, very quickly. Therefore, we will not fear, despite the fact the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the sea. In other words, despite the earthquakes, through the earthquakes. Have you ever felt like your life was in an earthquake? Have you experienced a life's earthquake? I'm talking about it just takes one phone call. It takes one second on Highway 680 and your life is in an earthquake. You get a call from a doctor and your life is an earthquake. Your children do something or come to you with an issue. Your life is an earthquake. You lose your job or you lose your health and your, your whole life is just shaken. It says though there's an earthquake, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the sea. Despite the fact you lose your job, he's still your refuge. Despite the fact you've lost your health, he's still your refuge. Despite the fact you've lost your spouse, he's still your refuge. Though you're found, the idea of an earthquake is so scary, like the one we see there in Japan, is the fact that what you count on, you can't count on it anymore. The old expression we used to say, sure is the world, sure is the ground underneath your feet because that was something you could count on. But when an earthquake comes, you have nothing else to hold on to, and you've lost it all. So though those problems come, though it's a loss of job, though it's a loss of finances, though it's a loss of spouse, still we can have God as our personal refuge. Though the earthquakes, through the earthquakes we can have it, through the floods, verse number three. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. We just saw a few weeks ago, Psalm 42, 7. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. I mean, you, we're talking about floods. We're talking about where the water just comes to co overflow you. I don't know if you've ever been under a, 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 a rip tide or something where you just can't get up and you can't stand up and you might think, well, I guess I'm just going to drown. I guess this is it. Boy, that's how the psalmist was feeling. He said, the deep over deep is just rolling over me, and I'm just thinking I'm about ready to drown. I think I'm about ready to give up. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to give up. Amen. Though the wet earthquake is there and the floods are coming over us, we don't have to give up. Why? Because we have God as our what class? Refuge. God is our what? Refuge. Oh, we find it. He is that great help in our troubles. So as the troubles come and the difficulty comes, He is our help, our present help, our personal help in all those things. I hope you believe that tonight. If you don't, if you don't say He's thinking that He's the strong enough refuge to go to, if you can't count on Him to be your refuge, when those trials and difficulties come, you will not have the strength to survive. You'll try to do it yourself and you'll be washed away. But I'm glad God is our refuge. He's our refuge, number one, in our present, our present help in troubles. Number two, He's our refuge because He is our provider of happiness in our trials. He's the provider of happiness in our trials. You say, preacher, you can be happy in your trials. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Look at verse number four. There is a river, the streams that whereof shall make, what's the word? Glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Glad, a gladness. In our trials, God can provide joy. In our trials, in our difficulties, God can provide that joy, that happiness, that peace. First Peter 4, 12. Beloved, I already read part of it. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in the trials, in the difficulties, but rejoice in so much you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad also with exceeding joy. We're talking about the gladness God brings. Notice very quickly, He is the source of our gladness. He is the source of our gladness. Look what it says there, talking about the waters over us. We're talking about the earth being moved. Verse number four, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, which I think is a picture then, not just of the Old Testament city, but of the church today, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. I like that little phrase. The more I think about it, the more I get excited. There is a river. Aren't you glad there's a river? Oh, we're talking about the thirst. In those days with the, with the kings, the enemy would come and surround them, and they'd just starve them out. 
they'd make them so they could not drink, they could not eat, and it was just nothing for them. But there is a river. I'm glad there is a river. Jesus is that river. He's the river of life. It's the river of grace, quenching our thirst. But let me help you with something. So there is a river. The streams whereof. The word streams there. Let me first back up. Glad means to brighten up. Glad means to brighten up. It says, shall make glad the city of God, to brighten up. Do you ever need brightening up? Well, when there's trials, sometimes you get down and you say, I just need something to brighten me up. God, our refuge, will bring that brightening up. He'll brighten your spirit. He'll brighten your countenance. He'll brighten your day. Brighten, you know, the word stream there means a rill or a channel for irrigation. It's a reel or a channel for irrigation. In other words, it's something you've dug out to draw off of the river. We, as we go down through, you look through the farm country out here in the, the Central Valley and whatnot, you find the river, but then they have the little channels they've dug off to pull the water out of the river to irrigate. That's what he's talking about there. He says, there is a river. Wonderful. I'm glad God is that river, uh, that grace He's given us, that joy we give. There is that river of God. But it says the streams. In other words, the little places where I pull off, channel off these things, these streams that come out of the river will provide me gladness. Oh, I'm glad I can channel off. I'm glad I can pull a stream off the river to bring me gladness. The river keeps flowing, but I for myself must have that channel, must have that stream. You say, preacher, how can that happen? How can you get that stream very quickly? There's streams of supplication. Streams of supplication. I begin thinking about it. So I've got the trials. I've got the difficulties. I'm just being burdened. And I've got all these trials trials going on. How can I find gladness in my trials? How can I find gladness in all these difficulties, all these storms? He's my refuge. But how is he my refuge? Because he provides for me the grace. He provides for me the gladness. I can pull off that little river of life. Streams of supplication. Say, preacher, how in the world can I find gladness? Why don't you try praying? Hello? Why don't you try praying? In Psalm 104, 34, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Where does that gladness come from? My meditation on Him, my time with Him, my prayer with Him, my interaction with Him, that meditation on Him, it is sweet and it brings gladness. Oh, you say, preacher, what do I do when I've got all these trials come and all these pressures come and all these troubles come and all these trials are upon me? What can I do? Spend time with God. There is gladness. That's, we've got the river going by, but I'm pulling a little channel off in prayer. I can spend time in prayer. I can spend time meditating upon Him and brings gladness to my soul. That doesn't stop the storms. That doesn't stop the trouble. That doesn't stop the trials. But I can find gladness as I pull off of that river those things that I need. Streams of supplication. Number two, streams of the sanctuary. Streams of the sanctuary. Oh, Psalm 122, 1, a song of degrees of David. I was glad. We're emphasizing the word glad here in this passage because he said that's what the gladness was. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, Maybe you've never experienced it, but when you've been down, <laughs> well, when you've been in those trials and those heartaches, you don't feel like going to church. That's what the flesh would tell you. But I tell you what, you can get to church and sing some of those songs. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. And boy, and you get the fellowship with the believers. You hear the good testimonies. You spend some time with them. Boy, just to come into church, he said, I was glad. You'll find you were glad that you came. It'll bring that joy. It'll bring, that's, that's just a channel. You say, I think I'm going to dig a little channel. I'm going to bring a little stream from that river into my life. That stream, if you will, of the sanctuary. Psalm, Psalm 16, verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and and my glory rejoice. This my flesh also shall rest in hope. Oh, just setting him always before you and not being moved. So we have the streams of sanctuary. Very quickly, there are the streams of salvation. Of salvation. And I'm not just talking about getting saved. I'm talking about remember you are saved. Amen. Oh, Psalm 37, 31, 7. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. For thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul, hast known my soul in adversities. I was glad and rejoice in His mercy. Aren't you glad for God's mercy? 
See, when you've got all these trials and difficulties, there goes the river, but I need a little channel. I need to understand that channel of salvation, begin to think about my salvation. I guarantee you, you say, i got troubles, but why don't you spend some time praising God for His mercy? His mercy that He saved you, His mercy that He provides for you, the mercies He's going to take you to heaven, that in spite of all the troubles we have, it's still His mercy we're still around. So it's a channel, a, 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 a stream of salvation. There's the stream of seeking. You want gladness in these things? Boy, it's these streams that come off the river. Streams of, of seeking. Psalm 70 verse 4. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. But there it is, and be glad those that seek him. Not just waiting for him, but seeking him. Where you say, God, I gotta know you. I gotta be with you. I gotta have your presence. I've got to get a hold of you. I need your grace. I need your help. I need your strength. I need this because the trials are upon me. And as you seek him, be glad in him. Well, when the trials come, sometimes you have to spend some extra time in prayer, some extra time seeking Him. Say, God, I can't get up until I found you. I can't get up until I know your presence. I can't get up from here until I, I, I feel you're interceding and your strength in my life. But going after Him. Then there's the stream of service. Psalm 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with what class? <laughs> gladness. Come before His presence with singing. I guarantee you, one of the great things you can do, you can find that gladness by that... By, the river's going by. There is a river, but I got a little channel. I got a little stream. And from that, I find gladness in the streams of my gladness as I serve Him. In other words, I get away from thinking about myself and my troubles and work on other people, labor for other people, minister to other people. Streams of service. Serve the Lord with gladness. He's the provider of happiness in our trials. He's my refuge. And in that refuge, in those storms, in those trials, I can have gladness. Glad, aren't you glad you can have gladness? That's how we're going to survive. He's that refuge very quickly. Oh, by the way, before we finish that, He's the reason for our steadfastness. Not only is He the source of our gladness, He's the reason for our steadfastness. Look there at verse number 4. There is a... There is a river, I'm glad about that, and the streams thereof. In other words, those channels that come out. Boy, if I'm just watching the river go by, that's one thing. But if I've got a channel coming to irrigate me, if I've got a channel that supplies me, whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place, the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Notice it talks about shall not be be moved. We sang that song just a few weeks ago. I shall not be moved. When the trials come, how many understand the challenge is and the need for having God as a refuge is to remain steadfast. To remain faithful, to remain consistent, to keep our spirit right, to keep our heart right, to keep our soul. Just being steadfast in these trials, being steadfast in these storms. But He's our refuge because He is the reason for our steadfastness. He's the one that helps us be steadfast. Again, verse number 4. Verse number 5. He's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Our steadfastness. Notice what it says. In spite of the heathen raging. In spite of the heathen raging. Again, in 2024, I don't know what the heathen are going to do, but they're going to be raging for sure. Verse number 6, the heathen rage. So it's not going to be moved in spite of the fact the heathen rage. The heathen are crying out. The heathen are persecuted. Those that are lost, again, we're not upset with them, but God's trying to warn us the heathen do rage. They do speak against us. They do try to devour those. How many understand that the devil hates the Christian life? The devil hates the church. He hates Christians. And so he does that. Psalm 2, verse number 1 says, Why do the heathen rage? Why do the he? I mean, you want, to make the, you want to make the world upset, you talk about Jesus Christ. You want the world to be upset, you read the Bible to them. You want the world to be upset and rage at you, you just try to stand for what's righteousness. Uh, I don't know all his political beliefs. I don't know all his 
Christian standing, but I know they recently put a man in the, in the speakership of the house, and boy, they raged on him because he dared pray. They raged on him because he said he believed God put him there. They raged on him because he thought he was, said he was going to legislate based upon the things of God. And they raged against him. You in the workplace, they'll rage against you when you try to stand for what's right. They'll rage against you when you try to do what's right and not just preach to them all the time, but just trying to stand for honesty and purity and righteousness. They will rage on you. So he's the reason for our steadfastness. Yes, we find about the streams that bring gladness, but he's the reason for our steadfastness in spite of the fact that the heathen rage. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Boy, they just imagine all sorts of things about Christianity. They imagine all sorts of things about you the kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us wow so in spite of the fact the heathen rage we can be steadfast when God's our refuge if I try to do it my own I won't be able to make it but he's my refuge then I'll be able to stand fast in spite of the raging heathen Psalm 83, verse number 2. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up thy head. They have taken craftily counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. I can be steadfast when he's my refuge. In spite of the heathen raging, and in spite of the kingdoms moving. Very quickly, I want you to notice this. Look what it says. Verse, th- verse 6. Verse 5 says, I shall not be moved. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. The word move there means to waver, slip, or fall. To waver, slip, or fall. I can be steadfast if God's my refuge, even when America moves. Even when America slips. Even when America falls. You know, I'm all for getting involved in politics as an individual. I'm all for the Christians running for office. I'm involved, but I got news for you. This old country, if Jesus tarries his coming, will fall. Country after country, nation after nation has fallen. So if I'm basing my steadfastness on the fact that I'm an American, I'm going to crater. My steadfastness must come from God. My steadfastness in my trials must come from God, my refuge. Oh, we cannot let, even if America falls, and it's slipping, and it's going to fall, but we cannot have, to, we don't have to be moved in spite of kingdoms moving. Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. By the way, aren't you glad you're part of a kingdom that will not slip? Part of a kingdom that will not fall. Part of the kingdom that will not waver. Boy, I tell you what, I'm glad I'm American. I wouldn't want to be anything but an American. But I'm glad I'm part of a heaven. I'm a citizen of a heavenly kingdom that will not slip, that will not change, that will not alter. And if America goes down the drain and we end up with con- Chinese communists running our city around here, still I don't have to crater. I don't have to fall. I can still be steadfast because I'm part of a kingdom that will not slip, that will not fall. We've got to keep our eyes on that kingdom, living for that kingdom. It says. The God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Aren't you glad we're part of a kingdom that stands forever? Oh, America, it breaks my heart to see where it's going, but I tell you what, I'm glad I've got a kingdom that is forever. Does not slip, does not alter, and does not follow. Psalm 145, verse 13. The kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Oh, my. If if the next generation, if Jesus tarries his coming, is underneath Chinese or, or North Korean communism or Russian communism, oh, I tell you what, our kids need to no, they're part of a kingdom that is from generation to generation. Regardless of what the politics in our land is, regardless of what the police around us do, we're part of a kingdom that endures forever. So in spite of the fact that kingdoms are moving, wavering, slipping, and falling, we can be steadfast. We just came from the Christmas season, Isaiah 6, 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's not, they're not talking about the White House. That government, they're not talking about the Republicans or the Democrats or the Blue Party or the Pink Party or the Green Party. No, the government shall be on his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and the peace thereof shall be no end. 
upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just, judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Boy, I tell you what, I can be steadfast. Why? Because God's my refuge. And because he's that, he's my reason for my steadfastness because I rely upon him in spite of the heathen raging and in spite of the kingdoms moving. Very quickly, he's our hopeful, our powerful hope, our perpetual hope at all times. He's our prevailing hope. Over everything else, we have a hope. Verse number 8, and again, we know the hope in the Bible does not mean just crossing our fingers. It's anticipation, expectation, and trusting God will do what He says. But He's our hope. Look at verse number 8. Come behold. We're entering the third section, because verse 7 ended the second section. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. So He's our refuge in those times of our trials. Verse 8, come Behold the works of the Lord. What desolations He hath made in the earth. So there we are, based, we can have hope, we can have prevailing hope, we can have prevailing faith at all times in our lives, in our trials, in our difficulties, because He is our refuge, based upon His past works. Based upon His past works. Aren't you glad His past works give us faith? Aren't you glad his past works give us hope? I read the Old Testament and I say, whoa, look what he did for Gideon. Look what he did for Abraham. Look what he did for David. Look what he did for all those great people of the faith. Yet that's the same God I serve. So based upon his past works, I have prevailing hope at all times. He's my refuge. I got trouble. I got storms. But guess what? I've got prevailing hope in him because of his past work that he's revealed to me. Oh, let the storms rage. Let the waters come up. Let the earthquakes come. Let the, let the different nations move and the kingdom be changed, but I can have that refuge, I can have that strength because I've got an all prevailing hope that overshadows all the trials, that overshadows all the difficulties because of his past works. Psalm 78, verse number 5, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. He says, you got to let your kids know this, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which shall be born, who shall arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Boy, we've got this prevailing hope because of His past works. Amen? Past works of the Bible and past works in your life. How many tonight can you give a testimony about God's prevailing and powerful works in your life? Oh, how He's provided for you, how He's cared for you, how He's done miracles in your life. Boy, because of those past works, I can have that hope, that prevailing hope, that prevailing faith even in the trial. That's how He is my refuge. His past works of creation, His past works on the cross, His past works in, provi in provision for me. Ooh. But preacher, i got such storms going on, such trials in my life. Yes, but God is my refuge, and I can have that confidence and that faith and hope in all times of my life based upon His previous works. Number two, believing His present wars. Believing His present wars. Believing through that. Verse number nine, He maketh wars to cease. Aren't you glad God's in control of all wars? I mean, when he comes, he's in control. You say, well, Russia's doing crazy things. God permits it, and God can shut it down. Well, you got North Korea doing these crazy things. God can shut it down. We know that those nations, the Bible says, it's just a drop in the bucket for him. He can take care of it. And so it says, his present wars. No, well, verse number nine. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Whether that's talking about the physical ones or just the fact he can take care of North Korea's missiles, he can take care of Russia's tanks, amen, he can take care of America, he can do that. So in present wars, I'm going to believe in him. I'm going to faith in him. Isaiah 54, 7 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall thou, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. His present wars. Aren't you glad God's in control of all the battles I'm in. Oh, I tell you what, it could be that this is that time of, Jer of, of, of Jehoshaphat where they didn't know what to do and they prayed to God and God says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. You just praise. And they sang praises and all of them woke up dead the next morning. It could be that he just believing in his present wars. Aren't you glad? I get to battle for him, but God takes care of the battles. God takes care of the war. His present wars. Not just his works of the past, but the wars that I'm in now. I'm glad he's able to handle it. And then 
how we can do this, provide this prevailing hope at all times, is beginning His prophetical worship. Beginning His prophetical worship. Verse number 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. So we've got His past works, His present war, but we've got His future worship. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Philippians 2.10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody will worship Him. Here's a, here's a secret for us. Start now. Start now. I mean, begin now. The, the prophetical worship is, yes, every knee, shall con- every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Why don't you start now? You don't have to wait till then. We can do it now. And I guarantee you how we're going to have this prevailing hope is when we go ahead and start praising God, when we start worshiping God, when we start magnifying Him and exalting Him. Oh, He's my refuge. How in the world am I going to survive this? By the prevailing hope and faith at all times, by the fact, based upon His past works in the Old Testament and His past works in my life, I can hold on. I can have that hope. I can have that faith that prevails over over all the storms around me because He is my refuge and I've gone into Him and I'm enduring in Him and I'm staying in there and I'm remembering those times of the past war winds and it's through His present wars that fact He does fight for me and I see Him victory and then I'm beginning that prophesied worship. I begin to praise Him. I start now and let it build as it comes closer and closer. Verse 11, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge Think of that. Think of that. I don't know what 2024 is going to have, but regardless of the trials, regardless of the troubles, regardless of those things, we have a refuge. Don't forget it. Know how to find it. Get into Him and stay there and draw off these things that allows Him to be our refuge. Let's bow our heads, please.